Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. Yana, I am so grateful you're joining us on Next Economy Now today. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Erin. So I want to start with a question. Before we get into your book, I want to start with a question around home. And maybe you could just bring our listeners in to where is home for you? Where do you connect to home? And and what does that mean for you? Well, I currently live in Laramie, Wyoming, and I live in a commune. So it's an income sharing intentional community. And we are on three acres of, I like to make sure to say, indigenous land that we are squatting on, even though we own it in some weird paradigm that we're all part of right now. And so I live here with six adults and two teenagers in one of the oldest still standing structures in Wyoming. And so home for me has a lot of colonial history in this state and is this delightful group of people who are all really committed to anti-capitalism and anti-oppression work. Yeah. And we're a mix of like families and singles and all that kind of stuff. And we share meals and share a lot of resources and do a lot of political stuff together. And so it's a great, lovely setup. Thank you. I And we'll get into more deeper in this conversation around what that means to be anti-capitalist and anti, you know, how that action looks like in terms of anti-oppression work. And, and you have a book that is actually, you just launched and it's kind of accruing out of maybe some of that experience of living in that collective space. Could you tell our listeners a little bit about what compelled you to write that book? Maybe talk about the other book you've written as well, the Together Resilient book. Yeah. Yeah. So Together Resilient, we'll start there because that's sort of where this project emerged out of. So Together Resilient is focused on local community-based responses to climate disruption. And as I was writing, and there's a big theme in there about residential intentional communities, which has been sort of my home zone for, gosh, 26, 27 years at this point. And as I was writing it, the section of the book on culture and group process work and stuff kept getting longer and longer and longer. And I finally went, this is like really out of whack with the rest of the book. And so I you know, had a conversation with my publisher and editor and was like, I think maybe this is just another book. And then it kind of went dormant for about two years until I connected with Karen Gibnig, who's my co-author for this project, which is the Cooperative Culture Handbook. And so we, you know, I had contemplated working on it with some other people and had done a little bit of work with other people. But it was one of those things where kind of the magic gelled with Karen and I, because we have community living in common, but then we have a whole bunch of other really different background. Like she's much more embedded in the business world. And I'm much more embedded in the like anti-oppression and social justice world. And we were trying to write something that would really speak to a pretty broad audience. Like anybody who is curious about how is culture affecting my group's ability to function well, like we wanted it to sort of work for a lot of different audiences. And we'll see as it gets out there, like how good of a job we actually did with that. But that was really the impression. And so we spent a lot of time over the year that we were actively writing together, negotiating a lot of spaces, like how do you bring social justice concepts in, in a way that like people are going to be able to not just hear it because I'm okay if like people can't hear some of it the first time they read it, but can actually be usable and can actually change the culture of organizations. And so that was kind of our motivation for it and our dance that we were in together, which was pretty dynamic. Can you talk a little bit about that framework that you provide in Resilient, Together Resilient? The three tables, the extreme cooperative culture, the Mm -hmm. extreme competitive culture, and then the balance between the two, a sustainable cooperative culture. Could you share that with our listeners? Because I think that is just so useful. Yeah, yeah. Well, and actually, and we did some reframing with it for the handbook. And so the columns are labeled a little bit differently. We've got it as mainstream culture culture 
counterculture, which is going to push a bunch of boomers buttons. And it's going to be fascinating to see how that goes. And then cooperative culture in the center column. And so, you know, the mainstream culture, and this is based on our experience as folks who live in North America. And so I have no idea how much of this would fly in other places. But, you know, in the United States, you know, we are the most individualistic, competitive, materialistically oriented culture in the world. And that's incredibly problematic. I mean, basically, if you can't compete in a capitalistic, hyper-competitive framework, you're kind of worthless in that mainstream culture in a lot of ways. And there's a huge amount of tie-ins with oppression and, you know, in our sort of colonial racist history as a country. I mean, it's all kind of tied in together. And then a lot of people have been trying to do something different. And so that's that counterculture column. And unfortunately, we make a lot of mistakes in terms of being able to be in really good, healthy relationship with each other in that what we're calling counterculture column as well, or extreme cooperative culture was what I called it in Together Resilient, you know, where there's a lot of us really needing to fit in. I mean, we have a deep need for belonging coming out of that mainstream culture and it gets poured into our our organizations a lot of times. And that need to belong often puts us into a place where we're martyring ourselves or we're squashing our own voices because we're afraid to offend the group. And it's sort of like the, you know, go along to get along kind of thing. We gloss over a lot of differences. That whole I don't see color thing is part of that counterculture framework. And when it comes down to it, it's not really any more functional than the mainstream culture. It's less harsh, it's less cruel, but it's not necessarily more functional. And so what we're doing in this book is really teasing all of that apart piece by piece and then articulating what we think of it as a healthy cooperative culture. And it's really one that is balancing out discernment with compassion. I mean, that's my highest level way of articulating what we're talking about here. It's much more about mutual aid. It's much more about consensus, but with healthy boundaries, because a lot of consensus process really has no boundaries to it. And that's not very functional. And so, so we're kind of trying to do a lot in this book, but those three frameworks are ones that I found to be incredibly helpful in the work that I do with groups and in the community building work that I do and increasingly in the social justice work that I do, you know, that we, you know, we need to not let ourselves get stomped on by people who are supposed to be allies, but actually like have those clear boundaries and have that good grounded sense of like, how can we actually be functional as a group? Yes, that that word discernment has come up a lot recently in in, in the consulting work I do. And, and I do appreciate kind of naming that this is the mainstream culture, the word you use is is reflecting in that word itself, the fact that mainstream culture invisibilizes so much Mm -hmm. the you know, the contributions of First Nations and Indigenous communities who oftentimes are, in many, many cases, exemplifying a different way (laughs) of doing things. There's there's not that mainstream culture, but because that mainstream culture has subsumed so much of other Mm -hmm. aspects of culture. Could you bring us into an example? Like, what was a moment where you were just like, ah, I need to write this book? (laughs) Because it might have been a lived experience or just something you saw out in the world that indicated to you that this would be an additive book to the world. Well, I think the primary motivation is that if our groups don't survive to do our mission work, you know, if we don't know how to make decisions together, we don't know how to resolve conflicts or talk about power, huge, big topic or balance our mission out with care for the individuals who are showing up for that mission we're not actually going to make any change in the world at all. I mean, we're going to sort of cut ourselves off at the knees. And gosh, you asked for a story. I mean, I think that's been like the theme of my entire 15 years of practice with organizations has been watching them fail over and over again. And just so much heartbreak that, you know, you see these groups that are like committed to working on climate change or committing to working on economic justice, you know, and there's all this energy around it for three or four months. and then the tension lines start and the conflicts start showing up and the inability to talk about stuff start showing up. And a lot of times what happens is either our groups kind of implode and never really get anywhere, or they sort of devolve into this like half functional sort of zone where you're not really getting anything done. And then the people who are the doers get frustrated and leave and you end up with the navel gazers left. And it's just like, 
you know, it's just not very functional. And so I think it was like a thousand little heartbreaks over the years being an activist that sort of went like, okay, we actually need to like piece this apart and get our hands a lot on like what would really functional look like. And those thousand little instances actually add up to a culture that marginalizes the power of cooperation because there's so many examples of it not succeeding or being really detrimental. So, I, yeah. our group has a, we have this joke, this sort of running joke where somebody will like leave their dishes in the sink or like, you know, some little tension line will happen. And the joke is, this is why consensus doesn't work. And we're poking fun at it because that's, you know, that's the conclusion that groups come to is like, this is why really deeply caring about each other and like trying to do things cooperatively doesn't work. And it's like, no, actually, you just need to learn how to talk about the dishes, you know, but it's like, we can't even do it at that level, let alone the like, you know, some white person in the group just did this really shitty, blatant thing. And we don't know how to talk about it. I mean, it's everything, you know, at like that small, not really that important scale, all the way up to the stuff that's like critically important to somebody's survival. And we had to learn how to talk about it. So it's a great segue to talking, let's talk about white people. Let's talk about <laughs> for a moment. <laughs> because you have a really beautiful story that you have documented in blogs and in public facing writing about actually having two name changes in your career. And could you share that story with our listeners? Because I think it really exemplifies mm -hmm. to how to work with white people on the learning journey of how to actually be anti-oppression, how to live that uh, as a value um, and how to how that's a lifelong journey, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I was 23, I changed my name. So my birth name was Victoria Jane Ludwig. And when I was 23, I was involved in actually my first intentional community experience was with a mixed indigenous and non-indigenous community that was led by an indigenous elder. And one of the things that um, she was teaching, her name is Kiwe Denokwe or Grandma Key, as everybody knew her by. And Grandma Key was teaching traditional herbalism and the traditional Ojibwe naming ceremony. And so I had an in change at that point, got a blessing from Grandma Key. And so for 25 years, my name was Maikwe Budwig. And over, I would say, starting maybe 10 years ago, I started to like get back in touch with more like anti-racism work and really starting to look at this, like, what is this colonialism thing? What does it mean? And grew increasingly uncomfortable with having an indigenous name. And a lot of it was that, you know, every time I would meet somebody new, there would, I mean, the most common response would be like, oh, that's really cool. You have an indigenous name, like tell me the story. And I would get all of this social capital out of having this indigenous name. And the Ojibwe community was not getting shit for that. I was getting a whole bunch of benefit from it and was like literally extracting social capital and benefit from that community who weren't getting anything out of it. And so I got increasingly uncomfortable with it and started that process of going like, okay, I need to change this. And, you know, when all of the white garbage comes up about like, so if I let that go, what am I losing? I'm branded. It's a unique name. I mean, just all of this, you know, this kind of intersection for me of like, capitalism and social capital and racism and white privilege all was this kind of tangled knot that I had to like, untangle. And so a few years ago, I took the jump and, act and changed it again legally. And so my name is now Mayana Catherine Ludwig. Mayana was my birth daughter's original name on her birth certificate. Catherine's my mom's name. And so I'm like, I'm just going to put myself really in my feminine lineage and own that and walk away from all of this other social capital that I've accrued through this other name. In your blog, which I really recommend, we'll put in the show notes, You, the blog that you wrote in 2018 was Surrendering Maikwe, mm -hmm. a step back from cultural appropriation. So could you talk a little bit, what is cultural appropriation for our listeners? How do you, how do you look at that? Or how, mm -hmm. how have people given you feedback around cultural appropriation? And you talked about, you know, the extractive nature of the relationship, but anything else you'd like to say about cultural yeah. appropriation? I mean, I think it's different than cultural sharing. And, you know, for me, the critical piece is what is the traditional power dynamic between 
you know, the identity that is taking the thing and the identities that are, you know, offering or having taken from them. And, you know, and there is like no denying that there is a tremendous power dynamic in this country between white people and people of color and particularly black and indigenous people of color. And so, yeah. And so, you know, for me, it was really getting it like I say, like how much benefit I had been deriving from that and being willing to own it. And that was, you know, I mean, that was part of the surrender language for me was that thing of like, so I'm, I'm laying this down and I'm going to do my best to walk away from it. And, you know, and there's a weird dynamic where like, so here I am now I'm on this interview and like, there's going to be other white people who are going to be go, Oh, she's cool because she did this work. And it's like, it's hard. Cause it's like, how do you, talk about it in a really clear way and not trigger more of that like weird white on white admiration garbage that I think comes up. And so it's like, I don't really want people's praise for doing this. This is like, I should never have taken on the name in the first place. And I don't know how to avoid that part of it. And it makes it really tricky. I think for us, as we're sort of like waking up through layers of this cultural fog that I think white people live in a lot. Yeah, that's so important. This notion of, you know, decentering yourself and whiteness. And it also makes me think your response to the cultural appropriation question was taking it out of like a one slice in time mm-hmm. picture and looking at in the context of a larger arc of history. And I, I really appreciate that because I notice that sometimes gets missed when we're out in the world talking about mm-hmm. appropriation or specific acts they get looked at as a slice in time rather than the longer arc and how they're contextualized within that. You brought up power. And I know you mentioned that power is something you address in your new book. And I'm curious if you could talk of maybe there's some strategies or some, some of the gems of content from your book that you would entice Mm -hmm. readers with. Yeah. Well, one of the things is that, so the structure of the book, so there's like this sort of longish introduction to the book, but the core of it is, 26 sections that are each a like what we call a culture key. And so it goes through and, you know, and takes apart that like mainstream counter cooperative culture, like what do each of those things mean for those parts? And, and like one of them is like, let me just pick one out. So there's one about security, for instance, where like in mainstream culture, security is money you know, money is power and, you know, you're secure if you have a big bank account or, you know, if you have a job where you're lucky enough to have health insurance coverage, like that's what security is in mainstream. Or if you have have property ownership. Property ownership is a big one. Yep. Huge one. And then on the other side, there's sort of this rejection of security that like I spent years living with people who were like, you know, we're going to like take a lot of risks and we're like not going to think about security and we're not going to, you know, that that's like kind of a worthless concept or it's kind of silly in a lot of people's minds, you know, in sort of alternative culture spaces. And what we look at is actually security is social. Security is knowing your neighbors and, you know, being in relationships of mutual aid and interdependence with other people. And that that's like a really different concept of security. And there's also obviously a a certain amount of like surrender of individualism and individualistic power in that where, you know, with the money thing, it's like, it's all about how much I can climb the corporate ladder and how much I can compete in capitalistic culture and really like over and over again in the book we're as we're doing that sort of taking things apart, you know, we're looking at like most of them, what does security mean now? And, you know, how can we sort of redefine that? And then each section also has two exercises that go with it. And in some ways, I think this is kind of the most interesting thing about it is that it's not just a, like a philosophical text or a, sociological or anthropological texts where we're sort of like talking about culture in this really distanced way. It's like, okay, now practice. Now like get in there and actually, you know, take it apart by doing something different or trying something different. And, you know, we talk about, you know, there's this exercise that I feel like has gotten really popular called like the privilege walk or power walks. And so we talk about that. And one of the ones that's a a unique contribution in the book is an exercise that I've been working with for a while called eight minute life stories, where I ask groups to have everybody go around and everybody tells their life story through a particular lens. So 
tell your life story through the lens of race or class or gender or growing up rural or urban or however you grew up. And oftentimes that, you know, telling the story is like it keeps it really human and it opens up spaces where we can connect with each other around our stories, but it also often reveals a lot about how we've related to power in our lives. And that's actually one of my favorite exercises in the book and one of the ones that I find, you know, most compelling in terms of being able to get into often really hard conversations about things like class and economic equity, for instance, but through each of our doorways, whatever those are. And so that's one of the many ways that we sort of get at power from a really human perspective in the book. I could imagine that to be really formative and also allowing people to be seen Mm -hmm. um, in a really uh, important way. Do any stories come to mind of sharing a story of an example, obviously holding confidence in some of the... the, Yeah, well, actually, the the first time I did it, we... So it was a nonprofit that I was involved with and the nonprofit had realized like, wait, we're really, really white and we should probably be looking at that. And so this exercise actually emerged out of me thinking, okay, how could I get a bunch of white people into a conversation about race in a way that is going to be, you know, as non-threatening as possible. And it was what was most fascinating to me about it wasn't the stories which were beautiful and touching and amazing It was the 24 hours between when I said, hey, we're going to do this thing tomorrow night and having people go at lunch and stuff like, I've never thought about this and I don't even know how to think about it. And that that I think is so much the experience that people who are in, you know, sort of traditional oppressor classes have with this exercise is wait, 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 my life is racialized. How is my life racialized? And just that process of watching people sort of go through that initial, wait a second, process, I think has been one of the most touching things for me about working with this exercise over the last few years with different groups. That really resonates. I want to ask you a question about in the spirit of lifting up and not just centering whiteness or white identified folks. What are you seeing in terms of some of the leadership that you're looking to some of the ways that you see cooperation manifesting in really beautiful and impactful ways in the world? And are there leaders that you're looking to or what are you paying attention to within this realm that our listeners could benefit from? Yeah, well, there's one of the most influential books for me over like really the last decade has been a book called How It Is by Dr. Viola Cordova, who was the first indigenous woman to get a PhD in Western philosophy. And she does an amazing job of sort of taking apart like this whole like what is having a worldview in general and sort of comparing the worldviews and the cultures of different groups. And so I would say if there's one book that I would recommend other than my own books that would really recommend people doing that. And There's a group called Cooperation Jackson that was inspired by um, Fannie Lou Hamer's work that I think is doing some really rad, amazing things with an entire town in the South. And I am super inspired by their work. There's also a lot of really rad stuff happening in Detroit right now that I think is really interesting. If you like Google and look into like community agriculture projects in Detroit. There's some really, really badass things happening. And Tawana Petty is one of the voices there that I feel really inspired by. There's an organization called the People of Color Sustainable Housing Network in the Bay Area that is also just like reowning their neighborhood in this really badass and direct and intelligent way. And so those are some of the places where I'm like, there's some really, really cool stuff happening here. And I also continue to take a lot of inspiration from the different income sharing groups around the country who I feel like are not all of them, certainly, but a lot of them are primarily white people who are now getting on like the social justice thing in like a really cutting edge and interesting way. There's a group called ACORN in Virginia that I think is having some really interesting conversations that they're making public frequently. And I have a lot of respect for that. Just that process of 
we're asking ourselves really hard questions and we're not going to hide our messiness in the process of doing that work, I think is being really inspiring to me right now as well. Wow. Yeah. I'm reading All That We Have to Save right now by Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. Mm -hmm. And in the first chapter, it's a series of writings by lots of uh, women of color Mm -hmm. around climate Mm -hmm. crisis and engaging in climate climate justice activism. And one of the quotes that I forget the name of the, it's a youth leader that writes about this, which she says, we're not going to save the planet if we have a thousand people doing it exactly right. We need millions of people doing the best. Uh, they can. Yes. <laughs> and I'll look up the name. Yeah, so I can no, share that's it. great. I would love to know who is talking about it in those terms. Because, you know, I do think that I, I did some writing like a long time ago about this, like, kind of perfectionism thing, which shows up again in the cooperative culture handbook, we talk about perfectionism dynamics and how it's like part of white supremacy. And, but there really is that thing of like, if I'm at like, step one, and I suddenly have this revelation where I realize there's 10 steps between me and perfection on environmental stuff, like so many people won't go to step two and step three, because they can't understand how you get to step 10. It's like, you get to step 10 by going through step two, you know? And so I just, I love this quote. It resonates a lot with stuff that I've been thinking about, about climate stuff and ecological stuff in general. There's so much I want to ask you, but we'll, <laughs> we'll keep taking it one question at a time. One of the things that has been coming up a lot as a question from my community is this question around how do we create new frameworks and systems so that more voices can be heard as opposed to what we've inherited, which is that the, you know, I think in your framework, you named the loudest voices went mm-hmm. out or, or something yep. like that. And even in the context of, you know, we're now in remote settings, so we're on Zoom a lot. And also in the context, I know there's been a series of articles coming up around interruptions and, you know, men interrupting women often, and then even women interrupting women. I've been noticing myself, I notice sometimes, I mean, I even noticed it on this call, I interrupted you once. And and just, (laughs) I'm wondering if you could help us unpack as people, many of us who have been acculturated in this dynamic of the loudest voices win, how do we, you know, decolonize that and look at maybe decolonize, not the right word there, but disassemble that dynamic within ourselves Mm -hmm. internally and in order to create a culture where more voices can be heard? Yeah. To some extent, it's like we wrote a whole book about this because it's really complicated. I mean, this is sort of one of the core ways that I think all of this competitive stuff shows up. But one of the culture keys that we talk about is about hearing. And the mainstream culture part of it is like, don't bother hearing. Like, I don't need to listen to you to have my life work. So I'm not going to bother to listen to you. And like, just like unpacking that one thing, like noticing who you don't bother to listen to as like just a daily practice, I think can be really, really powerful. And then, you know, on the counterculture part of it, we talk about silencing ourselves, you know, that sometimes we're, we realize we've been in this like competitive dynamic where we aren't listening to other people very well. And so sometimes we'll go to the opposite end of being like, okay, now I'm just going to shut up and I'm not going to put my pieces in anymore because I'm afraid that I'm going to be the bad guy in this case. And I'm afraid that I'm going to do something like oppressive and obnoxious to somebody else. And so I just stop speaking at some point. And really, you know, what we think is the best way to approach that is to lean into more about skillful hearing, because when you're focused on hearing, you're taking in the information that you need to be taking in and you're not waiting your turn to speak and you're not waiting to like, where's my opening where I can jump in and say the thing that I'm excited to say. And so you're doing that part of it, but it's also when you really hear, you have much more interesting things to say in conversation with people because you're able to really connect with what they're bringing to the table and add to it and sort of, you know, have our communication be something that is enhancing and lifting up each other's voices and needs rather than being so much just about like, how do I get mine in the course of this conversation? And so I think there's a whole series there of unpacking and like, watch who you're not listening to, watch when you're not speaking yourself, and then like lean more into like hearing and then speaking about what you're actually hearing that's genuinely coming from the other people. Wow. Powerful stuff. I'm imagining a world where we were 
acknowledged for taking, you know, a year of listening or, you know, I know there are people that are doing that for the wild is another podcast I listen to pretty regularly. And they just had a person on there who, you know, took 17 years of not speaking. And, and, uh, what? Um, wow. that yeah. is, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hearing how to hear. Oh, amazing. How to hear. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the little mantra that I have with it is that you can't accurately care if you can't accurately hear. Like we often think we're caring about somebody and we're like doing something that's good for them. But it's like a lot of times we never heard what they needed in the first place. And so we're like, I think we make a lot of mistakes from love, from like trying to really care about somebody but like, we didn't really get it in the first place, what it was that they needed. And we're sort of acting on kind of half-assed information to some extent, like we're really good at acting on half-assed information. Yeah. And how that gets actually reinforced or um, prioritized or rewarded in our society. The name of the man that was silent for 17 years as an act of climate, climate activism, actually, after seeing in the Bay an oil spill. One of his responses, in addition to stopping to driving in cars, is his name is Dr. Paul Francis, I believe. And Dr. John Francis. Dr. John cool. Francis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, nice. Are there any other parts of the book that you would like to bring in or lift up? So one of the things that was originally part of the culture chart that was in Together Resilient that we don't have in the chart this time, but is a, a pretty major part of the intro is this idea of disintegration. So if you think about modern American life, there's like this physical version of it where our, uh, you know, our home is in one place, our work is somewhere else, our kids go to school somewhere else. If we have like a, like a religious community or a spiritual group that they usually meet somewhere else. And so there's like this physical disintegration that is really tied in with car culture and that we spend so much of our time going somewhere and transitioning to somewhere. And there's a psychological parallel to it where most of us are doing some version of what gets called code switching in racial justice spaces a lot where, you know, I don't get to show up the same way at home as I do at work. Like work is often where the biggest disjuncts happen. But, you know, my kids are being schooled often in values that I'm not 100% bored with. And so there's this psychological drain that's happening for us constantly, I think, in modern American culture. And one of the things that I have really loved about living in residential intentional community settings is that I'm able to have a lot more of my life integrated. And so, you know, my, you know, when my son was being schooled, he was being schooled by people within the community. I used to not have to leave my community for like six or seven weeks at a time. And then I would leave when I wanted to leave. And, you know, so my work life, my values, all of it was really really well integrated. And I think that most of us don't even realize how much stress we're accruing constantly, or how much ecological damage we're doing by constantly zipping all over the place in our cars. And, you know, and this is one of the pieces that is sort of if there's sort of like a capstone to the whole book in terms of thinking about it, it to me is this like, phenomenon of disintegration versus like really having our lives reintegrated. And, you know, being able to be like whole, coherent people is a really rare gift, I think, when it happens for some people in our lives. And I really want us to move toward asking questions about like, how do we get back to a place where like our whole being is values aligned and our whole lives are values aligned for us? Wow. And to bring in questions of of power and of oppression into that dialogue Mm -hmm. is that's so powerful. How does your community talk about it and live into this idea that, you know, I hear often that that pushback against, oh, well, well, you're just doing that because you have privilege and you have, um, you have white privilege or, Mm -hmm. or whatnot that that allows you to do that. How do we grapple with that reality that privilege has a lot to do with who has access to those types of communities? And yeah, I mean, I think part of it is that we create communities of poor people and that we start there. And because a lot, you know, I mean, white privilege and economic privilege are closely tied together. They're not identical by any stretch, but they are pretty closely tied together. And so I think you know, figuring out how to have our spaces be economically accessible is one of the pieces that my particular community is sort of taking on. 
And I think also like finding ways to lift up and support communities that are led by people of color and, you know, and, and even have no white people in them at all. I mean, like white people can hardly imagine a space where like, you're not in it and it's not yours. And, you know, and I think like lifting up those examples and, you know, really supporting those communities getting off the ground. And so one of the groups that I'm involved with is the Foundation for Intentional Community. And we actually made a commitment earlier this year to be putting 10% of all of the unrestricted fundraising money that we bring in into funds for BIPOC communities and finding ways. And that was after like many years of process and like, oh, we can't like, that's like, feels really insecure to do that and to make that kind of a commitment. And, you know, and 10% is not a lot, but it's sort of a start. And I think, you know, the thing about community is that it's material. It is in the physical plane. And so I think you can't do your anti-oppression work in community in your head alone. You also have to be doing it in your relational field and in the material plane. And so I'm, you know, it feels good to me to be starting to see some chipping away at that whole thing. And so those are some of the ways that we're taking it on. And, you know, we're also starting a conversation about like, what does it mean that we are primarily white people living on indigenous land? And like, is there a give back process? Like, what are we actually going to do with that? And, you know, to not like automatically exclude the possibility that like, we might just turn this place over at some point, you know, and to really be having the conversation at that level. And like, what buttons does that push for us? And what do we need to work through to be able to contemplate something as radical as that? And so we're starting that conversation deep acknowledgement to you for starting that conversation. And I want to just name that you might be in a sticky situation where when you self-select to be in a space of communitarian values, sometimes the lens back on you is, is lifting you up to a higher bar as well. So it's like, imagine if every single family home in the, in the country were expected to have that same, every white owned single family home in the country were expected that, that same level of self-inquiry around relationship to uh, land and stolen land. We ha- obviously having a different conversation. So much. I mean, we can't even talk about reparations at the federal level, let alone like, what would it actually mean to decolonize America? It would mean a whole bunch of shit that like people do not even want to think about at this point. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Except for, you know, we're starting those conversations. Starting conversations yeah. And you have dabbled a little bit in the political system. <laughs> Can you tell our listeners about your... Yeah, I, um, so I ran for United States Senate and... So that which was a 14 month public process, like a couple months leading up to it, and then actually being in the race for 14 months ended up coming in second in the um, most competitive Democratic primary the state has ever seen, which was kind of like bizarre and amazing, actually, because I was running as an open socialist, running as somebody who lives in a commune, running as an openly bisexual woman in the most conservative state in the country. And so... Yeah, so that was kind of a whole thing. And it was really weird, like being in. So our political system is 100% competitive. I mean, that is what it's about. And so, so I'm in the process of writing this book about cooperative culture while participating in this like super competitive scene. And there were definitely moments where it felt like, talk about disintegrating experience. I mean, there were definitely moments where I was like, I need to not forget who I am in this process. And the interesting thing to me is that by not forgetting who I was, I ended up getting a lot of votes. And, you know, by being like very much like we need to be leaning into more cooperative stuff. We need to be like passing laws that make this more possible. We need to be, you know, looking at worker ownership, you know, which is to me, that's what socialism is actually about is like worker empowerment. And, and so it was interesting to me, like how much what I was bringing actually did resonate with people even in Wyoming. And also, I think I never want to do that again. (laughs) You know? Mm, great insight. And you're saying that the people are ready for cooperative. Yeah, culture. yeah, I think so. And I think I just did this like really bizarre case for that. <laughs> yeah, that's so heartening to hear. And, you know, when we're inundated with mainstream media, particularly in the lead up to this election cycle, 
of just hyper competitive. Mm -hmm. That is very, very heartening to hear. We are coming to the close of our conversation. I I wish we could talk for for many more moments together. And I do, I really encourage, I'm so grateful that you have this written out in a book, in two book forms so that our listeners can go and learn more. I want to ask you two last questions, which is, you know, when we think about this next economy that each of us is contributing different pieces to, what do you keep in mind as sort of a, maybe just a, a compass direction for you in terms of next steps for the next economy? What are you looking at? What are you paying attention? What is something that our listeners could be paying attention to as well that you think is a really important piece to hold on to on this journey? Yeah, well, I mean, for me, I, you know, I am a socialist. I mean, I do think like who has power in the economy and who derives benefit from the economy is the core question. And I think that, you know, that the United States, I mean, capitalism is not just going to like give up all of that power and control overnight. And so I think, you know, I'm really encouraged by the resurgence of interest in worker ownership and cooperatives in the United States. I like, I love that. I'm part of a worker-owned cooperative myself. And so that feels really encouraging to me. And you know, and I think that core question about power is also a question of like, like, how do we radically not leave people behind, even if capitalism has no use for them? Because I think that's where a lot of the dynamics around like, well, how do we deal with the homeless? It's like, oh, my God, like the fact that we, we other people to that extent, when it's like, so you're deriving benefit from the economy that has locked in the need for poverty. And we need to turn that a lot on its head. And so really looking at, you know, who do we radically include that are not normally radically included in economy conversations, I think is one of the North stars for me as we're moving forward. Thank you for that. I think that will resonate a lot with our listeners. What is the worker cooperative that you are a part of? Yeah, so it's, um, so my community is the Solidarity Collective. And We have like two community businesses, one of which is Solidarity House, which is our podcast, which is basically all things communal and lefty politics. And yeah, so definitely invite people to check it out. I think we're the only reality commune podcast in the country. We have one thread that is just about like, what is commune life like? And what are you talking about tonight at the dinner table? And what games are you playing now? So there's that part. And then there's like, you know, very serious looking at cooperative economics and culture and law is sort of another thread of what we do. So yeah, so all things lefty and communal covered at Solidarity House. That is quite a namesake. We're the only, what did you say? We're the only uh, reality rad- show. <laughs> <laughs> commune show. I love it. I love it. And so ways that folks can support you and your work in this movement is by listening to Solidarity House podcasts, you supporting your pet Patreon, spreading the word about your books. Any other ways that you can think of? Gosh, that would be amazing. <laughs> I mean, if folks are up for doing that. And so I have both a personal Patreon and then Solidarity House also has a Patreon. Um, So you can either support me or support the podcast. Both of them are fabulous. And then just like, you know, backing away from words like socialism and commune being dirty words that actually, if you could do that for me, that would be fabulous, everybody. Thank you. (laughs) Oh, <laughs> thank you. I, I that would be fabulous for me as well. And <laughs> and I think our whole society, our whole world would be served by that as well. The openness to different ways of living on this planet is definitely a critical skill for the next economy, I believe. So for sure. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your time with us today, Yana, and um, really just appreciate your work in the world. And I know our listeners will as well. Thanks, Erin. I appreciate it. Next Economy Now is a production of Lyft Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, 
Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. <laughs>